everyone. Uh, welcome to the Tamament Library and the Robert F. Wagner Labor Archive. I'm thrilled to see so many people here tonight. It's really exciting, um, both here and, and in, our, in our simulcast room on the other end of the floor. Um, welcome to you all, too. Um, I don't know if I'll ever get to welcome a simulcast audience again. <laughs> um, I'm Shayla Weber. I'm the Associate Head for Archival Collections here at the Tamament Library. Um, and I'm here to welcome you all tonight uh, to a celebration of um, a new collection here at the library, uh, the, the Real Rosie the Riveter Oral History Collection. Um, and tonight we're going to hear from a number of exciting speakers um, about the project um, and about the uh, different ways that the project is important. Um, and so before we get started, I'll just do very brief introductions of our panelists. Um, you'll hear more both from and about them later on in the program. Um, if you all could just wave so people know who you are when I announce you, that'd be wonderful. Um, uh, tonight on our panel, we have uh, Professor Ruth uh, Milkman of CUNY and the Murphy Institute for Worker Education and Labor Studies. Um, Elizabeth Hammerdinger, the executive producer of Rosie the Riveter Project. Uh, Anne DeMare and Kirsten Kelly, the two directors and, or the, and producers of each video. Um, and then we have two very special guests at the end here. Um, Esther Horn <laughs> and Jerry Kalbus, uh, um, uh, who are two of the women who were generous enough to tell their stories um, so they could be a, become a part of the archive. Um, and you'll see more of them on screen this evening, too. Um, and also, a little later, you'll have an opportunity to ask questions of our, our panelists. Um, so right now, I'd like to introduce uh, the Dean of the Division of Libraries at NYU, Carol Mandel. Thank, thank, thank you, Chael. Um, I'm delighted uh, that you are all of you, even the ones I can't see, are um, over next door, uh, are here tonight. Um, and I just want to tell you a little bit um, of how this project got started, because I, I'm so grateful to the two great ladies that, uh, that conceived of this. Um, the brilliant playwright and my friend Elizabeth Hemmerdinger, and who introduced me to um, the extraordinary filmmaker uh, Anne Demar, and and they um, conceived of, they became interested. In, Elizabeth, and I'm sure she'll tell you about it. So has been interested for a long time uh, in the topic we're here to discuss tonight, and um, began working with Anne. And they thought about making a, a documentary film, and realized as they um, dug into their subjects that their subjects really spoke uh, for themselves <laughs> and in very powerful ways and came to me and, and these two amazing people along with uh, Mike Nash who really knows what oral history does and can mean and has created terrific oral history collections here for the Tam Library that really tell the story of the 20th century in lots of ways. Um, and um, so Mike really helped shape this as oral history and worked with Anne and Elizabeth and, and Kristen and, and I think you'll see the products of their work, but it's been a wonderful collaboration. I can't think when we've started a project in quite this way, and I, I'm very grateful to them because it kept mutating a little, you know, in what we thought it was going to be. And, and the other component that, um, you know, makes such a big difference, I think, is also 21st century technology has really um, been, is bringing us 20th century history in a way that we could not have imagined. And I think you're going to see that later. And I very much also thank the folks in our digital library technology services who uh, were able to use the extraordinary footage um, that was created and and bring it to you uh, in in oral history. And I think I think you're seeing here. I'm going to see the way history will be done and and the kind of documentation that that we will have about our world that we can only get in this way. And and then of course um, this history brings it all to life and and. Uh, 
Elizabeth and Anne have uh, been introducing us to the Rosies as well, and you'll have that wonderful opportunity. I, I do want to um, note uh, that I am uh, really sorry um, that Mike Nash, who's so much a part of this project, is, is actually just not well enough to be uh, with us here tonight, so we send him all our good wishes. and. Um, and yeah, I, you know, we're not able to simulcast this to him. Just <laughs> so maybe that, but this will be recorded <laughs> next time we will. So, um, so thank you all, and thank. I, I'm just so grateful to the folks that put this project together, and on with the show, right? Thanks, Carol. That's <laughs> all right. <laughs> um, so our next speaker tonight is a longtime collaborator with and friend of the Tamament and um, is a sociologist of labor and labor movements who's written on a wide variety of topics including work and organized labor in the United States, both past and present. Um, her early research focused on the impact of economic crisis and war on women workers in the 1930s and 1940s. Two of the eight books she's written focus on women and gender issues in the workplace. Um, and she spent 21 years as a sociology professor at UCLA, where she directed the Institute for Research on Labor and Employment from 2001 to 2008. Um, she came back to New York in 2010 and is now a professor of sociology at the CUNY Graduate Center and professor and academic director of the Murphy Institute for Worker Education and Labor Studies. Um, so please help me welcome our distinguished guest, Ruth Milkman. Thanks very much for that introduction. I'm really honored to be here. I have very sentimental thoughts about the tenement where I long ago as a young scholar, I spent quite a bit of time looking at various collections and things. And I think I even deposited some stuff here at one point. So anyway. Um, as Chula mentioned, I kind of cut my teeth on this topic when I was much younger, um, in the late 1970s and 1980s, and have continued to ponder it ever since. Um, this is a very timely invitation for me because I'm starting on a new project right now comparing women's experience in the Great Depression, which was the very first thing I ever studied as a young, young uh, researcher, um, to women's experience in the Great Recession. I'm just at the beginning of that, so I'm not going to talk about that tonight. Um, but the, my research on World War II came out of that initial project, actually. And um, I, as you mentioned, um, I did write a book about women in World War II called Gender at Work, and was also very marginally involved in the film that you may know, The Life and Times of Rosie the Riveter, which is kind of the predecessor to this project in many, many ways, from what I can tell so far. Um, so, I've, so I'm just delighted to see a new wave of interest in this whole topic. and. It's extremely timely because, as we know, people don't live forever, and if you're going to do oral histories, you've got to do it while they're still around. So it's really wonderful that you all have managed to capture so many important stories you know, in this period. I have to tell you a funny story about this, though, because when I was at UCLA, uh, several years ago, actually, um, I have a lot of gray hair now, and I guess I was starting to have it at the time this occurred. It was probably five or six years ago. Um, a student there once asked me if my book on World War II was based on personal experience. <laughs> and, well, obviously, you know that, you know, I said to her, do the math, how old would I be? And, you know, but um, in a way it was, because for me, anyway, my interest, I mean, I didn't know this at the time I was studying it, but I feel like my interest in the topic really did come out of trying to understand my own family history. And my, my mother was not a rosy or anything, but she was very much a product of the 30s, especially, and the war as well. My aunt was in the Women's Army Corps, and anyway, over time I've come to appreciate that, in a way, this was not such a crazy question. <laughs> but, but anyway, um, the big question in the scholarship, which is what I was asked to speak to you about tonight, on Rosie the Riveter, is this. Um, what is the meaning of what of the radical changes, or what appear anyway to be radical changes in women's position um, in the workforce and more generally in American society during World War II. And scholars have pretty much been debating this ever since the beginning of the writing of women's labor history in, which really started in the 1970s, arguably a little earlier. Um, so you all probably know the basic outline of what happened. I mean, it's pretty well known now. 
six w million women entered the labor force just between 1940 and 1944. That's a lot of people in a very short time. Um, and more importantly, the previously closed doors to what were then called men's jobs um, were suddenly thru you know, thrust open. Um, and that was not just an industry. I mean, our focus tonight is on Rosie the Riveter, the women who entered factories in jobs that had previously been monopolized by men, but it wasn't limited to that. Um, there were more women entering various positions in the professions, among scientists, pretty much anything you could name, because there was such an extreme labor shortage as the Depression ended with this huge economic boom here in the United States. So, um, and all kinds of other things happened. I'm just going to, I don't have time to go into great detail, but it, first of all, it was not just women who got new opportunities in the workplace, but also African Americans, other racial minorities, disabled workers. Um, other things changed besides access to jobs. The government suddenly wanted to fund childcare, which was not very, very common prior to that. Um, women's leadership in all kinds of arenas grew, as did opportunities for leadership for other previously excluded groups. It was a period of enormous national unity, very hard to imagine right now. Everybody was against fascism, pretty much. I mean, I, there were exceptions, but the vast majority of the U.S. population. Um, there was a strong left. This was, as Studs Terkel once called it, the good war. People were for it. Everyone wanted to defeat Hitler, et cetera. Um, perhaps less well known, the gender gap in pay narrowed very, very dramatically in the 1940s, especially in the kinds of industries that the Rosies worked in, for reasons I'll talk about them in a minute. Um, so it was like Sweden in those industries. I don't know if you know this, the gender gap in pay here in the United States today is about 70 percent. That is, women earn, on the average, roughly 70 percent of what men earn for full-time year-round work. In Sweden, it's 90 percent. Well, during the war, it was 90 percent in industries like auto, shipbuilding, et cetera. Yeah, but it changed again later. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, and I mentioned that partly because, oh, and, and this was also a period of general compression, the opposite of today, the, the era of the 1% and the 99%. This was the economists, of, economic historians, I'm sorry, often call this period the great compression because income inequality dramatically narrowed. And this was, of course, due to two things, really, the New Deal itself, which preceded the war by only a few years, and the rise of the, the biggest surge in labor unionism that the United States has ever experienced, which also occurred just prior to the war and then accelerated during the war. And the unions were interested in narrowing wage inequalities and were very successful in doing so. And there were other things, too. You know, there were wage price controls and things like that. The, the, the economy was highly regulated. So it couldn't be more different than the period we're in right now in all these different ways, right? Um, so I want to say a little bit about, since I am a labor person, about the, that aspect of this whole story. Um, think about this. The Rosies enter basic industries like, well, there wasn't really an auto industry during the war. I guess New Yorkers don't have as much trouble as Angelinos imagining this, but no cars were produced during World War II. None, zero. The government ordered the factories to convert to producing war material. The U.S. was the arsenal of democracy. That was the phrase at the time. Um, in other words, since we, the war was basically not fought except for Pearl Harbor on our soil, um, this became the engine of industrial production. And that's why there was such a labor shortage. So the U.S. was busy making airplanes, tanks, ships, et cetera, most of them destined for abroad to be used in the war. And there was enormous, enormous, enormous demand for that. That's why there was so much um, demand for this labor that our Rosies participated in. So all that is going on. And um, th this is occurring in the very factories, the very industries that the CIO, the Congress of Industrial Organizations, which formed in 1935, only four years before World War II started, six years before the US entered it, right, had just organized them. And they mushroomed like crazy. So the Rosies are entering this arena that has just been radically transformed by unionism. They were non-union industries for the most part prior to that. Um, and so part of the equality I mentioned was a product of that simple fact. Um, it wasn't just the CIO. People don't know this. Those of you who know a lot of labor history do know it. But the sort of conventional wisdom is that the CIO is what the 30s was all about. Actually, the AFL, which was the older unions, the so-called craft unions, they weren't all craft unions, but many of them were, um, 
grew even more rapidly during the 30s than the CIO. The labor movement as a whole grew rapidly. And in some of the industries where Rosies were employed, like shipbuilding, it was actually the AFL that predominated, and sometimes in aircraft too, depending on which part of the country you're talking about. So all these women not only enter basic industry from which they had previously been either completely excluded or limited to very marginal jobs, but they also become union members virtually overnight in the early 40s. Um, and the unions are transformed by this in a limited way, but still in a significant way. Um, women's issues suddenly are on the agenda of organized labor. The UAW, for example, started a women's department at that time. Um, you may not know this, but Betty Friedan was a, a staff member of the United Electrical Workers, then the thir third largest industrial union in the United States. I learned this, <laughs> this is a crazy story. When I was doing my research, it was focused on the UAW and the UE. This was in the 70s and 80s. And I, at that time, the UE still had its headquarters here in New York. They don't anymore. They're in Pittsburgh now. It was right near St. Patrick's Cathedral, and I went there looking for help on my project, you know, and I talked to some guy who seemed very old to me. He was probably about the age I am now, but I was very young. <laughs> and um, he said, oh, you're interested in Vim and Val. <laughs> Benny Friedan used to work here. And my reaction was, I'm not interested in bourgeois feminism. Tell me about the working class, you know. But I was so wrong. If you know Daniel Hor Horowitz's biography of Betty Friedan, which explains where the book The Feminine Mystique really came from. It was really out of her history in the labor movement and the left, and I completely missed the significance of this at the time, but now we all know, thanks to Daniel Horowitz. Um, well, so in short, there were these enormous changes for women, many of them a product of you know, uh, labor movement activity, though not all of them. Um, and yet, as I'm sure you're all aware, these changes proved very short-lived. After the war ended, Rosies were expected to return back to wherever they came from. And the pre-war gender division of labor was quickly reestablished. The gender pay gap that had narrowed so dramatically began to widen again. Um, although the increase in women's participation in paid work was a permanent change. That it really, there's a brief period of what they called reconversion, um, unemployment, that's when the factories went back to producing for civilians like cars and stuff. Um, uh, but that was very quick. Many people feared there would be a new depression after the war because the only thing that ended the depression in the first place was World War II, really. But that didn't happen, as you know. Instead, we had the biggest and longest economic boom ever in this country's history. And um, as that occurred, women's labor force participation continued to grow, including that of married women and mothers. Um, and that continues to, well, we all know that that's continued to the present, you know, with some bounces here and there. Um, but what when, what did go back to how it had been was the gender division of labor, the system of job segregation, as we sociologists tend to call it, where certain jobs are stereotyped as female and others as male. And of course, the Rosies broke that barrier briefly. Um, and of course, a lot of other things happened after the war, too. I don't have time to go into great detail. I wouldn't want to spend the whole evening here. But um, there was reaction, not only on the gender front, but the Taft-Hartley Act was passed in 1947. Those of you who know your labor history know that was sort of took back a lot of what the Wagner Act of 1935 had provided to organized labor. This is the era of McCarthyism. Starts even during the war, it's beginning, but really takes off at the end of the war. This is the Cold War period, et cetera. And of course, for our purposes tonight, the feminine mystique, as Betty Friedan so indelibly labeled it, emerges in immediately after the war. Um, by the, not, by the 50s already, Rosie is a sort of fading memory, a kind of icon of this wartime era, until feminists like myself rediscovered her in the 60s and 70s. And then Rosie became a different kind of icon. Even a film star in that film I mentioned before, which appeared in 1980. It's a long time ago already. But, you know, um, so, you know, in a way, we feminists at that time, we kind of stood the conventional wisdom on its head. The conventional wisdom was Rosie took a man's job out of patriotic fervor to win the war against Hitler, willingly returned home afterward. And we decided, oh no, that was all wrong. It was male chauvinist propaganda, outright discrimination that forced women back to the home where they suffered in silence and frustration until the new women's movement emerged. <laughs> you know, so in a way, they're like the mirror images of each other, these stereotypes, you know, and they're both way too simple, in my opinion. Um, well, at least that's what I decided as I began to study this in, you know, 
which I did for several years. Um, so now memory is a very tricky business, both collective memory and individual memory, as I'm sure you all discovered. Um, so and history is too, oral history and you know, the kind of written history that some of us, I'm a sociologist by my union card, but I have written a lot of labor history once in a while. I get mail addressed to the Department of History and it gives me a little thrill, you know. I sort of always, I, I'm a kind of wannabe historian. So, but anyway, both the traditional conventional wisdom and the feminist versions, I think, are, are way too simple and too um, undifferentiated. They're both class blind, for one thing. The scholarship shows that most Rosies were not former housewives, but had already been in the labor force um, prior to the war because they needed to work for money. Like, most people work for money, and, you know, there are a few of us who get to do jobs that are fun, but, right, that's the reality always. Um, what changed was, again, access to very well-paid, so-called men's jobs. Leaving home was not new for most of them. There were some. I'm sorry? Oh, you can't hear me back there? I'm, so I'm not used to this. I have such a loud voice. Okay. Um, so what I said is that Rosie's mostly were not former housewives. Some were, but um, had been in the labor force before, but they were in traditional female stereotype jobs, you know, waitressing or uh, cleaning houses or clerical work or something like that, as opposed to so-called male factory work. Um, and yet, so that changed with the war, with the labor shortage. Employers, at first reluctantly, and then they really had no alternative, hired women in very large numbers to staff these factories that were, you know, had this an endless thirst for workers. Um, and yet, as my book and some other people's research has also shown, job segregation by sex persisted during the war. It just took a new form. So Rosie the Riveter did a man's job, but she did it in a all-female job classification. They basically reconfigured the sexual division of labor. Now remember, the jobs were different. They weren't making cars, they were making trucks or Jeeps. They weren't making toasters, they were, they were making you know, radios for airplanes or whatever it was. So that, you know, there was an opportunity, they were starting from scratch in a way, but the employers didn't know any other way to organize work but to say, okay, this is a man's job, this is a woman's job. And so they did hire these women, but, and, and they were jobs that would have once been called men's jobs, but actually they were still segregated. So they did get paid better because of the unions, as I mentioned, but this is, so like, that's just an example of how it's a lot more complicated than it appears on the surface. Um, and also, even though women had stepped into these unconventional roles, obviously, I mean, in, in many ways, the cultural definition of womanhood, of gender, really shifted much less than the feminist reconstruction of all this implied. Um, Rosies were wax and waves, they were, they were, um, sorry, Rosies weren't wax and waves, but women were wax and waves, Rosies were Rosies, women were in these war jobs. Um, but many more women were nurses, volunteers, um, doing, you know, what women had always done. And so we sometimes forget that. Also, um, domest the sort of culture and ideology of domesticity and femininity remained largely intact, even in the war plants. So in the research I did, I remember running across um, you know, women were required to cover their hair when they worked in factories because the hair could get caught in the machinery otherwise. So they would have like 12 different styles of industrial bonnets that you could choose from, <laughs> or you know, that kind of thing. And um, all kinds of disputes in the archives about, uh, you know, grievances about whether you were allowed to wear a sweater in the factory because it might catch on, you know, women wanted the right to wear feminine clothes. So there, it, again, it was more complex than we sometimes assume. The, the sort of feminist embrace of, you know, these sort of macho looking women in there work outfits was not necessarily the view of women who actually did these jobs at the time. Um, and also the government propaganda, and this is now well known partly thanks to that earlier film I mentioned and you've probably, many of you seen it, the government propaganda portrayed women's war work as an extension of domesticity, not a, domesticity, not a challenge to it. In other words, you were doing this for your family, for the war, for the community not because you were stepping out into some male role, right? It was, it was constructed in a very deliberate way that wasn't a challenge to traditional gender roles. Um, and sometimes it was even constructed as an opportunity for romance or adventure of some kind, right? It was in, in a kind of very conventional way. Um, now, on the other hand, so that's the sort of, you know, bottom line. At the same time, there were hints of other things. So there were more so-called career women, that's what the phrase was at the time. My mother used to use that phrase. Um, she wanted to be one, didn't quite manage it, but 
um, in the media. Think of those old films like Adam's Rib or Woman of the Year, if you remember those. Um, those were sort of proto-feminist, but they were not really what working class women were watching. That was sort of a different level, a, a different piece of the society. And, but, you know, still important. So there were, anyway, there were uh, a lot of things, a lot of complexity going on. Um, in terms of the working class story, as Dorothy Sue Cobble's book, The Other Women's Movement, has shown, um, what she calls working class feminism did emerge in this period, again, out of the labor movement. Um, so women's presence in the unions and the emergence of women's issues in those organizations that I already mentioned um, actually had a lasting legacy that was not very visible at the time it was going on, but, it, but Kabul has traced the connections between the events of the, the 40s especially and what happened in the 1960s. And issue, things like the Equal Pay Act of 1963 can be traced directly back to the legacy of the labor movement during the war. Um, Equal pay was a huge issue during the war because male workers and male unionists were concerned that if women were allowed to do so-called men's jobs, since women had traditionally been paid less, if they were allowed to do that at rates that weren't equal to what men's rates traditionally had been, that that would undercut the labor standards that they had fought so hard in the years just before the war to establish. So they supported equal pay for equal work, as it was called. Of course, most people don't have equal work. We we learned, we learned that later. Uh, some of the unions learned it then. Um, so, so that was, and that's part of why the wage gap narrowed so much, right? Um, so there were equal pay, um, well, rulings. They weren't really laws, but prior, during the war as well, the um, various government agencies instituted this, union contracts instituted it. was always not perfectly enforced, but that was there. And in some industries, what later came to be called pay equity or equal pay for jobs of comparable worth. Those of you who follow this sort of thing might remember that was a big issue in the 1980s as well. Um, that also gets traced back to the World War II years. The UE, the union that Betty Friedan worked for, actually pioneered um, on that front. Um, there were other issues, as Kabul points out, that were raised during the war that continued to be issues today. Work, family, balance, as we call it now. They didn't use such euphemisms then, but uh, things like maternity leave and um, child care, paid maternity leave, were emerging. They emerged before that, but World War II gave a big shot in the arm to those kind of things because the unions had some power and there were all these women in them and women's leadership emerged in unions just as it did in other parts of society because the men weren't around. Um, so, so I'm sort of pointing out something obvious here in a way that, that you know, history is not linear. There's not the sort of teleology of progress, but at the same time you can see that um, things did, in a very complicated way, one step forward, two steps back, if you like, did move along in, on the gender front during the war, only to be, um, you know, uh, there was a lot of pushback immediately following, and yet some things persisted. Um, I think there are many parallels here to our own time. In, in other words, the story of women's work more generally in the United States and, and the history of, of, of it over the last century is a history of change on the one side and continuity on the other, just as during World War II. So there are certain things that stayed the same during the war, even though, again, the drama sometimes obscures that, um, and other things that did change. Um, I think we have the same thing today. If you think about the enormous changes in the um, roles of women and men in our society, that I myself have definitely benefited from in that sense too. I guess I'm a rosy of sorts. I mean, it is my personal experience to be in that first generation of women professionals that really took off in the 1970s. Um, and yet, we know sex discrimination persists, not just in the sort of garden variety form where, you know, this one gets paid more than that one because of gender. That does happen. I've seen it, and it's probably many of you have too. There are a lot of women in this room of various ages that I'm sure have seen this. But the more insidious form of it is actually job segregation by sex still a main axis of gender inequality in the US and other countries' labor force? It's not that women aren't paid the same for what? For equal work, though they often aren't, but that they don't have equal work, that still most jobs are either, they're not labeled the way they were in World War II, it was explicit. They, you know, I found these lists in the archives, men's jobs, women's jobs, you don't see that, it's illegal now, supposedly. But in fact, in reality, how many male childcare workers do you know? How many female truck drivers do you know? Most jobs remain highly segregated by sex. So in that sense, there, there are a lot of parallels. And I think 
you know, again, the nonlinear aspect of all this is in our own time, too, we are seeing a backlash against some of the progressive changes that occurred thanks to the emergence of the second wave of feminism with attacks on everything from affirmative action to who could have imagined it? Contraception. I mean, you know, so it's, there are, I think there's a lot to be learned aside from the intrinsic interest of this topic, which is to me endlessly fascinating. There, there's a lot, there's, it's a mirror in a way into our own um, experience. Um, and I think, I mean, part of what I always thought about World War II in understanding the dynamics of women's work is, is that it, it kind of gave us, uh, because the changes were so rapid and so extreme, it's sort of like putting a big magnifying glass over processes that are taking place really all the time in terms of things like job segregation or cultural constructions of work. Um, the World War II is unique, but at the same time, it's, it's just kind of a more extreme version of what always happens in my view. So in that sense, um, I guess that student wasn't so far off that, you know, this is based on personal experience. So I'll just stop there. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Ruth. That was really great. Um, uh, so next, um, I'd like to introduce uh, our next guest. Um, she is an award-winning playwright and an NYU grad. Um, she has an MFA from Tisch School of the Arts. Um, some of you may have know her from her writing uh, on the Huffington Post and a website called Women's Voices for Change. Um, she was the executive producer of the Real Rosie the Riveter project, and really um, it was her vision who, that brought this uh, to, uh, to fruition. Um, so, um, but I'll let her tell you more about that. Um, please help me welcome Elizabeth Hemmerdinger. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not gonna talk all that long. Uh, if you have any questions for me, come and ask me after so we're all together. You can't hear me, I'm sorry. Is that better? Okay. I'm, I'm too tall, too short, and <laughs> soft-spoken. Um, first of all, you, can you hear? Stay further away? What? Closer in, like that, okay. Better? Okay. Um, I, I don't think I'm the power behind this in any way. Uh, Anne and Kristen and I worked on this together. The real power behind it is the dean who, um, for whom a light bulb went off and went, you know what? Uh, I think we have to make a place on the shelf in the library for these stories. Um, and they're stories that would not have been heard. They're examples of six million or eight million or 12 million stories, each a very personal and then kind of universal story. And so we've just had the honor to listen to these stories and I've had the honor to work with two incredibly warm, generous, gracious, um, talented filmmakers. I wanna tell you one little tiny anecdote from yesterday. The three of us were invited to Hunter Elementary School, which was my alma mater. And um, we uh, made a little presentation to the sixth grade class. They're very smart. I hope you're admitting them like crazy. <laughs> and um, uh, and we, we got invited back. We did well enough. We're going to go back and talk to the high school, to the 11th graders, because they're studying American history again. But um, a question occurred to me as we were, as we were speaking. And I, so I'm gonna ask everybody here, how many people have been on the Intrepid? How you in the other room, raise your hands too. <laughs> um, Ruth alluded to this. That ship was handmade, that and every other ship and every other airplane, tank, all the things that we, can, we need for the war, guns, they were all handmade and pretty much by women, and they, um, they, they served their purposes and saved the universe, if nothing else. I'm a little dramatic myself. Um, and so I want to thank uh, our two stars who are here, Esther and 
Jerry. Don't, don't even look at them, because you're going to see them in a moment. Um, and all the other Rosies who we've already uh, captured on film and given space for their stories. To the donors who uh, were generous enough to give us the funding to do this work, because women have to get paid for their work. And, uh, and now I get to introduce a little clip that was uh, done by Anne. Um, that was our promotional clip and our introduction into the world of the Rosies. And so with that, I think that that's where we go, right? So thank you all for being here. And one of the bosses, Mo Kammer, would read a scene from Othello and we would discuss it. Remember the, the differences in education. I saw all around me people, some of whom had never finished eighth grade. It's just entranced. We all went to see Othello, and we saw Paul Robeson and Uta Hagen and Jose Ferrer as Iago. from a factory. <laughs> when the war broke out, that was the first time I really had a job which I liked. Even though I don't like the idea of the war, I mean, it was something that I knew how to do and... Uh, ...use tools. Oh, this is a flexible shaft. This you use for drilling, polishing, um, burring. You use it for everything. These are all workers from the machine shop. Tricks were played on, on newcomers like me. I'd be sent to the tool room. What the, they call it the tool room? Some name like that. It was like a big cage with all kinds of tools to get a left-handed hammer or ask for a bastard file just to make me blush, you know? But I knew that we, were, we were, weren't treated equal, you know. I knew as far as the pay went and everything. I said, I, I, I want to go to the union. I want to see the union. So I went to the union. I think it was Mr. Brown. And um, I said, look what's happening. I said, this is not true. I was supposed to be a journeyman, a dollar twenty an hour. You're still taking my dues. And he says, you know, we don't want you women here. I said, oh, you don't? I said, why do you think we're here? I mean, there's a war going on. I mean, are you aware of why we're here? And I really laced it into him, and he got it for me. I said, oh, oh, oh not enough, but you're gonna get it for all the other women. These women are wives and girlfriends of the men who were fighting, and they were from Oklahoma, Kansas City, and they couldn't really fight for themselves, and so we, we got it. Tricks were played on, on newcomers like me. I'd be sent to the tool room. What the, they call it the tool room? Some name like that. It was like a big cage with all kinds of tools to get a left-handed hammer or ask for a bastard file just to make me blush, you know? <laughs> but I knew that we, were, we were, weren't treated equal, you know? I knew as far as the pay went and everything. I said, I, I, I want to go to the union. I want to see the union. So I went to the union. I think it was Mr. Brown. And um, I said, look what's happening. I said, this is not true. I was supposed to be a journeyman, a dollar twenty an hour. You're still taking my dues. And he says, you know, we don't want you women here. I said, oh, you don't? I said, why do you think we're here? I mean, there's a war going on. I mean, are you aware of why we're here? And I really laced it into him, and he got it for me. I said, oh, oh, oh not enough, but you're going to get it for all the other women. These women are 
wives and girlfriends of the men who were fighting. And they were from Oklahoma, Kansas City, and they couldn't really fight for themselves. And so we, we got it. discovered as we got into interviewing women was that Rosie was neither the kind of portrait of her that was drawn in the 1940s or the portrait of her that was kind of co-opted by different causes over the course of time since then, that she was actually real women. And that as we began to talk to more and more <laughs> women, um, we got this really interesting portrait of America at the time. Um, and we heard stories, we heard a lot of funny stories, we heard a lot of difficult stories, we heard stories about race relations, we heard stories about economic movement. Um, and I realized, I think we all realized as we were doing this that the great gift of having the opportunity to create something like this was that when these women are no longer with us, that piece of history really will slip through our fingers because it's, they're not voices that were heard. Um, so it was a great privilege to kind of have the opportunity to sit and to carve the space to really listen to that generation of women. I think we forget very often that um, we tend not to listen to older generations. Um, it's really interesting. We're all very interested in history, but we don't necessarily take the time to listen to the people who actually lived it, um, which is an interesting <laughs> thing. Um, we'd rather read about it. Um, so, uh, so that was the great gift of, of meeting the women. And, uh, it's been a great joy to have uh, Esther and Jerry with us from the very beginning. Jerry was actually the very first person that we filmed um, for this project um, and has been with us the whole way. And Esther was the second person that we filmed. Um, and since then, we, we, traveled to, um, we traveled to the Detroit area. We traveled to Baltimore, where there was a huge um, business in creating aircraft, um, Lockheed Martin starting there. Um, we went to Nashville to the National Rosie the Riveter Convention. We took like a team of like five, uh, five people with us to go and to film women there. And we met women from all around the country there. Um, and it was a really, this project as it stands as an oral history project really is, I, the, pers the people I thank the most outside of the people who help make it possible to house it here are the women themselves, to be so generous with their stories and to remember things and to work on remembering things that they themselves had forgotten. You talk about like memory is an interesting thing, both collectively and individually. Um, Elizabeth actually coined a great phrase early on in the process, which is that there's kind of a pearlization that you do to your own memories. Um, and so it's really only the long format oral histories we were able to do where we sat down with people for an hour, an hour and a half, you were able to kind of break through that shell and learn details that I think would have been forgotten. Um, and it's interesting because it, it is in the details I think that the oral histories are really powerful. Um, yeah, go yeah, ahead. Well, yeah. it, it's interesting too because you, you, I think we come from a particular background of theater and writing and directing and storytelling and I think that paired with um, the oral history interest and the oral history expertise um, really made for a powerful project in terms of this subject because I think it, it, because she was such an icon and for me even just coming to this, that's kind of all I knew and then really finding out that, oh, my grandmother was a Rosie and she didn't even think she was a Rosie because she was doing wartime work the whole war in a factory. And she never thought she was a Rosie because she wasn't that poster girl. <laughs> and so she was a girl coming from a farm and it was the first chance that she ever got to be off the farm and to be, have this camaraderie with other women. And the shocking thing was, you know, sitting down with her was she remembered that she was so, so excited to have her own money that she bought 27 bras. <laughs> and, and I, was, I was like, Grandma. <laughs> that she had remembered, but as Anne was saying, it, it, it is in the details. And it was interesting to watch over the course of interviewing so many women that, you know, it, it wasn't this moment where everybody said, um, 
oh, I was this icon. It was really taking the time to focus on the details of each individual story. And what we tried to do is get um, a taste, if you will, of many different experiences. And in an effort to not say, okay, it's this one thing, it's like Rosie becomes Rosie's and Rosie's and Rosie's. And out of that, we get a tapestry of a deeper history, which was exciting. <laughs> um, so now we'll go ahead and open it up uh, to questions from the group. Um, so anyone? <laughs> So the question is, if, if what you found complements or differs from the, the earlier Rosie film from the 80s, 1980s? Um, I think it differs only in that the women that we talk to um, have an extra 20 years of life to kind of look back and reflect on. Um, and the difference in terms of the goal of the project, we were really interested not just in their experiences being Rosie, but really the tapestry of their whole life. We started with their childhood experiences. <coughs> Um, and ask them to talk about what their economic environment was growing up, what they remembered from their childhood, which was really interesting as you got into some of the really rural lives, which we don't really have as much anymore. Um, and so the, the portrait on the oral history is really takes you from these young women and their lives before the war through the work and how that changed their lives and then after the war, whereas the film in the 1980s was really focused more specifically on their role during the war. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that filmmaker was a woman called Connie Field, and I see in the audience here Miriam Frank, who also did a lot of the research for that oh. film. I don't know, Miriam, what happened to the oral histories that were done for that? Because they actually were, they're not all in the movie, but well, they were much more extensive. They really yeah. were life histories. Oh, right. I don't know where they're deposited. more thoroughly, and then 20 really thoroughly, and then five for the movie. And those five for the movie fitted into one hour, which they had to share with a lot of um, uh, documentary material from the time. So the, uh, the vast archive of material, some of it videotaped, some of it audio taped, and I believe Jerry Calvis was in that uh, Interview. Who were interviewed for that? Jerry. I, I don't remember. <laughs> 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 um, that archive, I believe, is at the Schlesinger. Oh, okay, at Radcliffe. Right. I didn't know that. Yeah, I believe that's where that stuff is. And um, but this stuff is here. And what's really cool is that it's a, it's a, it's a, it's all of it videotape. And it's very, very high production. Basically, the high production didn't come in until they were really filming for the movie. So uh, this is this is sort of more delicious and, <laughs> and more accessible, right? I mean, yeah. uh, the gentleman in the red sweater shirt. It's it's interesting because as we oh sorry um, he was asking if there was any other kinds of workers other than industrial workers in this kind of time oh and and African American women um, we if you also look on the website too um, we have several African American women um, and. Um, you know, we have a lot, we really tried to get a, a cross-cultural experience of what was happening at that time. So we have women from the Deep South, rural women, we have African-American women. Um, we really tried to get, you know, city women. And what was the interesting thing I think we learned was almost everybody traveled somewhere. There was an adventure involved in, oh, I heard about this job up in Detroit, or oh, I'm from the South, I have to go to Richmond, I have the, you know, there was a lot of independence 
the young women, you know, 18, 19, 20 years old, stepping out for the first time on their own and earning their own money, but, but traveling somewhere and being in an entirely foreign place on their own for the first time. It, that was a huge part of the story. And, and yes, there's some really wonderful, rich uh, oral histories from some African-American women on the, uh, as part of the project. Here behind the pillar. <laughs> I just want to say that my mother and father both uh, helped to build ships in, uh, in Fredericton, Washington. They, uh, they came from New Orleans. And uh, the father's family was sick. But I think my mother was a welder. And I never thought of her as a yeah. <laughs> Uh, so it's just relating a, a, a story of both his parents, mother and father, built, going from New Orleans to Bremerton, Washington, to build ships. Right near Seattle. Yeah. So are they still with us? Are they still with us? No. Uh-oh. Uh, Karen, thank you. Um, I was curious as to where that icon came from. That's a, that's a Westinghouse publicity poster that was done for, yeah, it was done to bring women into the plant in Westinghouse in Pennsylvania, yeah. And the, question, the question was, um, where did the iconic image of Rosie come from? There, um, I was just going to throw that question down to our Rosies, too, because um, what was that image like that has been so important in history after the war? What, what was that limit, image like? during that time or after that time? What is your relationship to that we can do it image? I mean, just we were doing it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't think of myself as Rosie no. because I wasn't working on airplanes and tanks and ships. I was in a machine shop, small parts. I didn't weld, I soldered. And <laughs> it didn't rate. So, I liked the song when the, I think the Andrews sisters sang Rosie the Riveter. And I asked a young woman today if, if she knew who they were. No, she'd never heard of them or the song. <laughs> it, it, real quickly, it's interesting because we interviewed um, a group of women called the Roby Girls in uh, rural Michigan. And, they, and what was interesting about their story is that it was a small town of 2,000 people, and the one factory of that town, which made tennis shoes, they revamped to make uh, canvas covers for shovels so that soldiers could carry um, their shovels and dig trenches as they were uh, fighting. And um, you, know, you really started to see that, okay, it's not all about just the airplane or the huge machinery. And that was a very big part of the story. But this, this story was small towns and, um, s you know, quote unquote, smaller jobs. Um, and you started to discover this huge tapestry of different kinds of jobs that were Rosie's. And my first job was out in Cal to, oh, sorry. my first job was in California making the sidewalk breakers and the hand drills. The, and then I went, uh, yeah, the sidewalk breakers. And we used to ride them. <laughs> um, I, have a, I have a question from the other room. room. Just, just um, a oh, yes, sorry. No, I, I just wanted to add on to Jerry's <laughs> recollection. I worked at um, a, sh uh, there were different contracts that were given out. And some of them lasted a couple of months. So I had a few jobs before I went into the machine shop. And I think the first one was working on pistol belts and parachute suspenders. And my job was inserting that, the metal lining in the hole where you put your laces through and your oh. shoes. And you know. <laughs> I stood at a kick press oh, yeah. for eight hours a day. So that was that one. And then I worked at... Um, in electronics, I became, a, that was after Gus Axe. I, after the machine shop, I went into uh, electronics and I became a wireman. <laughs> I wired radio sets that were destined to go to the South Pacific. And uh, yeah, there was one more, I don't remember what I did there, but it was electronics also, and then the war was over. And 
I watched the uh, troop ships come in because <laughs> I worked the factory overlooked the harbor. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I have a question from the other room. Um, uh, so what did you learn um, was important in, in doing effective oral histories? Um, I think there were a lot of things. Um, I think that you, I think that the, the listening skills are different. You know, um, you have your idea of what you want to hear when you go into doing oral history, and then you have to kind of on the fly adjust it to what the person wants to say. And I think that that's really the most interesting thing. I mean, and I really miss Mike Nash being here tonight because he worked so um, unbelievably hard with us to kind of develop the script for how we would how we would approach the different women, um, and that script remained the same throughout the process. It evolved a little bit, but what what became differently was kind of the questions that became inserted between those lines, um, and I think we became better and better as we went along at really trying to understand that each person, in the same way that they have a different story, there are different things about their story they want to tell. Um, so I think that that was what I learned more than anything else. And I, well, we were incredibly blessed with uh, Jerry and Esther being our first to um, interviews because they yes. both had such wonderful contexts for their whole life. And Esther, um, I have worked with for several years in an um, intergenerational theater company called Roots and Branches. And so that's all we do is uh, build, um, build theater pieces based on people's life stories and storytelling. So I think she really kind of went along on an early ride of an early interview with us. And, but we had, a, we had a relationship and she also knew how to tell a story. And that really helped us be able to form um, the later relationships and the later interviews in, in deeper and deeper ways. Oh, thank you. I'll repeat the question afterwards. There's a simple answer to that. Do you want to repeat the question um, before I try to respond? To try. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, it was a generally a question about how um, the experience during the war ended up benefiting women, um, and specifically, I think a, a general interest about the way that women learned from one another and and um, uh, about skills or abilities or just that they could have roles that they weren't aware that they had before. Is that? Not right. Okay. So there isn't. Sorry. So there isn't a simple answer to that, which is, I guess, maybe why it wasn't so clear in my talk, because that's what I was trying to convey. And on the one hand, the, you know, women did get access to new roles and new kinds of work during the war, which was then taken away in most cases. Not always. Not so much in the sciences, actually. It was harder to enter after that. But the women who um, achieved that stayed, like those teachers you were talking about, right? Um, but for the Rosies, they were mostly kicked out of the jobs that they had acquired during the war. That didn't mean they left the workforce necessarily. Some did, some didn't. The overall um, position of women in the workforce did continue to grow, but in a more conventional, traditional set of jobs that had 
always been thought of as women's work and that paid a lot less and had fewer opportunities to move up and all the rest of it, right? And at the same time, there was a lasting legacy. Some people held on. Um, others became advocates for women in all kinds of different arenas. It sounds like you two did that. So it's complicated, you know? And on the surface, it looked like things sort of went back to how they were before. But in fact, there were quiet changes that continued. And so just like today, you know, it's, there's a kind of complex movement of ch change is not all at once or um, linear. Um, I, I can actually add something interesting to that just because one of the, we interviewed two women um, that had really different stories. This was two of the African-American women that we interviewed. One of them was born in 1919 in the Mississippi Delta and she went on to move to Detroit. She was she became one of the fastest welder, fastest riveters on her crew. She was an amazing woman, Angeline Featherstone Fleming. Um, and at the end of the interview, we always ask them kind of, you know, towards the end, you start to ask them what they, what they did after the war. And she was so unbelievably well-spoken and, and curious, and she had been a teacher at one point because they, they, she was recruited to be a teacher in the African-American schools in the South. I was floored that after the war, she went back to doing laundry. I was just floored. Like, it never occurred to me that that, that would be the case. Flip side is we interviewed another African-American woman in Baltimore who literally used all of her earnings, she put them aside, and she put herself through college, through one of the, the African-American colleges, and she got out of that. And she says very specifically, I didn't want to take care of other people's babies. I didn't want to be that person, live that life. And so she was able to take herself and, and really change her circumstance. So I think that that's the, one of the interesting things about doing an, extent, an oral history project like this is you see both sides of what can happen, and you see that there isn't one path. There were there were millions of paths. Um, so, yeah. Oh, I, well, I was going to say in answer to the part of your question that wasn't repeated. It isn't that hard to learn to weld or rivet or solder. Um, we can all learn or change a diaper. Uh, we can. <laughs> We, we can all um, do any of those things. Um, my husband who's sitting back there was wonderful with the children. He's terrific with the grandchildren. Um, but I egged him on. And uh, he egged me on to learn how to change light bulbs and, and you know, do the things that we, uh, it's not that hard. Um, right? I mean, not that you didn't do a great job, but. <laughs> can I hold this back too? Well, um, but you could. I well. can answer. Esther Directly. Um, you got on the job training because there was no time to, to go to school or anything for these things. You were there, here, do this, do it this way. And you did it, and then you, you became more skilled. And then um, after the war, it was up to you which way you wanted to go. And uh, what I got out of it, I think many of my coworkers did too. It was a, a newfound confidence that you could, you could be productive, you could be worthwhile in an organization. You, and um, wh whichever direction you went in, you went with much more confidence. The, the question was uh, uh, for, for Jerry and Esther, um, excuse me, and what was your experience after the war? Did you continue to work? Were you politely asked to leave? Well, unfortunately, uh, they held us back uh, at the shipyard. I, I was at Cal's ship and I was an electrician. Um, uh, what I was doing was in the staterooms of the uh, Sail. I was on the tankers and the liberties, and uh, I had to put up two bunk lights, a ceiling light, and two desk lights. And I learned how to do this, but I wanted to learn the panel board, and because I, I became a journeyman, but they wouldn't teach us this. So after I left, I couldn't continue. So because what did they you do? Didn't I went back to waitressing and different jobs that, uh, unfortunately, you know, it was the war that paid me my uh, biggest uh, salary sure. at that time. Did you get the hobby? 
still work with tools as a hobby? Oh yes, I learned how to wire and everything, and I um, and I also operated a a, a a lathe, drill presses, and many things. And I, then I had my own machine shop for a while. Oh, the um, <laughs> that was a fiasco <laughs> because only because I took in four young boys, and I'm not I'm and I'm not a person. I don't know how to give orders, <laughs> and I'm a doer. You should have hired and, women. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I had a lathe there, I had a, a bandsaw, a drill press. One of the boys cut his thumb off, <laughs> one of them cut his leg, oh. and I just couldn't. It just, it just it was a fiasco. I had to sell all these tools for twenty-five dollars <laughs> at that time. Are you looking at me? Yes. Yeah. Well. <laughs> <clears throat> I had been a factory worker before, before I of the war. Uh, <clears throat> not for long. Excuse me. <clears throat> I got out of high school in 1940. So between 40 and 42, I could only do factory work, pretty much, or unskilled other work. I, I, was a, I worked in a press clipping bureau, reading newspapers all day. Um, I worked in a perfume factory, um, stuff like that. Oh, I worked on WPA for a short time. And um, this was a new experience. And then I went on to a new chapter. I became a clerk typist. <laughs> After the war. After the, yeah. Um, here. I have a question about the two women that you were speaking of. One went back to doing laundry. And I know it's the whole thing I'm raising is very broad. Yeah. Because some of the people who came into the workforce were not married, uh, and they were young women who were starting out, and it was exciting, and they went on from that. There were other people who were married, yes. and they were married to men who came back. Yes. And the question I have is, like, did the woman who went back to doing laundry, was she a married woman? No, at the time. She met her husband while she was working in Detroit. But this whole thing of the family dynamic of who was married and what the, how it disturbed relationships also affected the relationships between the men who were returning and the women who'd been in the workforce and now were out of, out of that workforce is a whole other interesting, complicated. Ruth, you want to take uh, that? Because unfortunately, we interviewed women because of the age who entered the workforce much younger. Um, right. We didn't have the chance. Yeah, yeah, yeah and later. So. Yeah. Right. Um, let me re just question. repeat sure. the question. Um, so it was a question about. Um, sort of younger women and single women without families who, who had this work experience versus women who already had families um, or who had uh, husbands overseas come back after the war um, and sort of their domestic situations and how that affected uh, their, their work and, and what happened afterwards. So it's so complicated because, well, because think about who decides um, who's going to get hired for particular jobs. It's not husbands. I mean, they may object or something, and sometimes that's effective. But employers are the ones who choose who to hire, not workers, not families. Families may decide that they don't need to send as many people into the workforce or something like that. So in terms of being, um, having the option be working in a laundry instead of in a factory or um, not being an electrician or whatever, that's because, well, for two reasons. First of all, it's not completely the employers because the shipping industry basically collapses after World War II. There aren't very many jobs for men either. So, and, and the reconversion means everybody's kind of thrown out for a little while. And then as the peacetime economy revives, employers figure out who to hire. So that said, there's also all kinds of interesting dynamics inside households. So the, and the history of women's work in the 20th century, the sort of historical arc of it, is that it, the first, the early pattern is for women who can afford it, the normal pattern is you work for a little while whenever you leave school, then at some point, most women <coughs> in those days still, even today, most do, but fewer today, get married at some point. They might stop working then or when they have their first child and then maybe go back at some later point when if, although many women, 
couldn't afford to do that and work continuously. But over the course of the 20th century, what changes is that there's, and this starts during the war, huge growth in married women and mothers' employment. That's why the daycare thing happened. So, so that starts in the war. It continues afterward, almost without interruption. There's just a teeny little dip in 1945, and then it goes back to, and, and in the 70s, it really takes off, and you start to see it, it becomes actually more common for mothers of young children to be in the labor force than for other women. Why? Because the um, men's pay starts going down. I mean, that's a whole other complicated story, right? So, you know, and how that plays out in individual households, you know, varies enormously. But, the, but I think the important part is, like, part of why the construction of Rosie's as working as an extension of rather than a challenge to domesticity is exactly what you're asking about. In other words, this was not seen as some kind of challenge to your marriage or something like that. It was, you were doing it for the community, for your family, for the war, for your husband or boyfriend maybe, or brother or father who was fighting over there or whatever it was. So it, it didn't feel like a challenge to that for many people. Of course, in practice, it was empowering as we just heard. So, you know, it's complicated, but yeah. We've got time for just two more. Uh, the, here I don't behind know if you're aware of the thousands of, uh, of women and uh, that were hired uh, without anything to do in the plants. I mean, I was hired, I was uh, trained as a drill press operator. For three months I worked drilling on a, a hunk of steel. There was nothing they gave me to do that had any value whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> the point was that they were paid for our employees. Uh, <laughs> Maybe they also produce something I never saw in that plant. Wow. Interesting. We haven't so heard that story. That's very interesting. Incompetent management continues to this day, of course, <laughs> in many workplaces. But wow. <laughs> um, so a, a, a story was related about working um, in a factory, where, uh, being hired to work, and but there was actually no uh, substantial work to do yet. And she just drilled holes in something. <laughs> Oh, because the place was paid by the employee as opposed to by the piece or the product. And, yep. and that just brings up a point that I, I just want to get in before we end in, in that if you are a Rosie or if you know of a Rosie who has an interesting story, will you please come find us and get our card? <laughs> uh, I don't know that we're going to be able to hear the story tonight um, <laughs> because that, that might be too much, but um, we would love to be in touch with you and... I know that all, all three of us have cards, and we would love to, to have you know about us yeah. and vice versa. Yeah. Okay, so one, one last question. Yeah, my question is for the uh, guest of honor. And I was wondering if you could tell us what it felt like to you personally when you were told that you had to leave. So, so the question is for, for Jerry, um, what it felt like for you personally at the end of the war when you were told you had well, to leave your job? Well, I was glad that I was able to leave because knowing then that the men were coming back and the war was over. But uh, I didn't know what I was going to do as a job. And so I, went, I had to go into waitressing because I had very little schooling. And uh, I did want to go to war but they wouldn't take me because I didn't finish my high school. I had to later on get the diploma. So, so I just had to go back to the work. Okay. Well, so I want to thank you all so much for coming tonight. This was really thank wonderful. You. Um, and thank our, our really fantastic group of panelists.